sitting here. So today is Mother's Day. And uh, Sal came to me uh, a couple months back and said, you know, you'll preach Mother's Day again. I said, okay, uh, sure, why not? I'll do it. And uh, I got some uh, great mothers in my life. The problem is I preached Mother's Day like just a couple years ago and a couple years before that. So when you start to go through things, you're like, we already talked about that. I already talked about that. I already talked about that. And, uh, you know, my mom's great. My wife is great. But does everyone need to hear that over and over and over again? I mean, my mom and my wife do, but... uh, so a, uh, I, I was reading an article today, and, uh, or not today, but recently, and it kind of spurred me on, and we're going to do things a little bit differently this morning. We're going to kind of celebrate some of the women of the Bible and some of the characteristics of the women of the Bible and uh, how it, can, uh, it reflects uh, a woman or a mother uh, of God. So I, I got a quote from uh, Brigham Young. He said, if you educate a man, you educate a man. If you educate a woman, you educate a generation. And I think that quote, that simple little line, just kind of like it really exemplifies the impact that a woman and a mother can have uh, on her children and those that are around her. So I went through and I started thinking, well, what are some words of wisdom? If women are so great, so incredible, what are some things that women of wisdom would say that could impact our generation? And instead, I got sidetracked and uh, found some things that moms would never say. Things that mom would never say. Mom would never say, how on earth can you see the TV sitting so far away? Moms would never say, just leave all the lights on. The house looks so much more cheery. A mom would never say, let me smell that shirt. Yeah, that's good for another week. A mom would never say, go ahead and keep that stray dog, honey. I'll be glad to feed and walk it every day. A mom probably wouldn't say, well, if Timmy's mom said it's okay, then it's okay. A mom wouldn't say, you know, the curfew is just a general time to shoot for it. It's not like I'm running a prison around here. A mom would never say, don't bother wearing a jacket. The windshield is bound to improve. And then I saw a, uh, a definition of a sweater by Ambrose Beer said that the definition of a sweater is a garment worn by a child when its mother is feeling chilly. <laughs> and uh, that is so true in my house. When the weather turns just slightly, we go from spring to summer wear and summer to winter wear very fast. Uh, mother would never say, to tell you the truth, I can't really tell when you're lying to me. <laughs> And a mother would never say, those starving children in Ethiopia, they wouldn't eat this either. (laughs) So moms say a lot of things, and there's probably a ton more we could uh, get into. Today we're going to look at uh, what made Mother's Day. Mother's Day was started back in the early 1900s, and essentially it was the driving force behind a woman named Anna Jarvis. Anna Jarvis. Anna Jarvis's mothers would always say there should be a special day for women, just a day for women. And this is something that always stuck in Anna's head. And eventually, when Anna's mother passed away, she made it her kind of life's goal to fulfill this dream of her mother's, to set a day apart. So she started by organizing a special celebration at her Methodist church in West Virginia. And during that celebration, they used pink carnations, and and, uh, they used the carnations in that celebration to kind of acknowledge uh, mothers because that was her mother's favorite flower. Eventually, over time, it took a few years, a few, uh, a few times going to uh, back and forth, at, uh, but in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson signed a proclamation designating Mother's Day to be recognized on the second Sunday of May. So we've been going on a little bit over 100 years of celebrating uh, Mother's Day during this time. Now, later on, as Mother's Day started to become more popular, uh, ironically, Ann, uh, Anna Jarvis got frustrated with the process, what was going on with Mother's Day. Uh, she actually felt that people, it was becoming too commercialized, and she was upset, uh, particularly upset with Hallmark, who was capitalizing on this. So I actually really agree with her. Uh, but back then, Jarvis, she actually believed that people should appreciate and honor their mother through handwritten letters expressing their love and gratitude instead of buying gifts and pre-made cards. So whatever you did, just return it. Write a little note, say, love you, 
and hand it over, and you'll be honoring uh, Ann Jarvis and her mother. So we uh, know that Mother's Day often reflects flowers. Flowers are kind of a big deal on Mother's Day. Uh, talk to any florist, this last week has been uh, ridiculously crazy. And Mother's Day actually accounts for a quarter of all flower sales throughout the year. So one week, uh, one quarter of all their sales are accomplished. Now, uh, some statistics from two years ago, this is all from 2017, uh, people spend $813 million on cards. And uh, I bought a card this past week, and I can understand it only takes a couple cards to get to that, uh, that cost. Uh, they spend $2.6 billion, billion with a B, $2.6 billion on flowers, uh, $4.6 billion on jewelry, uh, they spend $1.8 billion on service, special services like the spa or a pedicure or something like that. Uh, total sales on Mother's Day last year or for Mother's Day last year was $23.1 billion. Uh, add in the online sales and we're looking at nearly $28 billion total dollars. That's $186 the average person spent on their mommy. That's uh, from two years ago. Now, most old school churches will hand out carnations uh, on Mother's Day. You'll walk out and the mothers will get a nice pink carnation. And we're not handing out carnation. In fact, most of the mothers got uh, little nail files, right? Yeah, and everyones they're probably using it. So sometime in the middle of the service, you hear that scratching sound. It's either the sound system or someone using their gift right away. So this morning, we're going to look at a beautiful bouquet of women and flowers throughout the Bible. Now, I got all my flower facts. I got to put this out there. All my flower fa facts from the website teleflora.com. And then the inspiration behind this is an article I read by Rom, uh, Robin uh, Schinkel. Fun last name. So we start out with the first flower, which is a carnation, which is very familiar to us, beautiful, mostly pink. Uh, the carnation in itself comes from the Greek word called Corone, which means a flower garland. And we get, uh, when we think about a garland, we think maybe like a crown, something that's put together, a beautiful crown. And when I think of crown and I think of the Bible, I think of Esther. And Esther, a beautiful example of a, a strong woman uh, following after God in the Bible. So it, Esther, ironically, was, or not ironically, Esther was a beauty among beauties. She caught the eye of the king, uh, king Xerxes, I'll pronounce not his Hebrew name because I can't pronounce his Hebrew name. His Hebrew name is Ahasuerus, and we'll get to that. So uh, basically the king's looking for a new wife, a new bride. They gather all the women of the, uh, of the country together, all the beautiful women, and Esther stands above them all. In Esther 2, 17 through 18, the king loved Esther more than all the women. She won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. So he didn't place a flower garland on her head. He didn't place carnation, but he placed an actual crown on her head. And giving her the power of the crown, Esther is now in a special position to be able to help her people down the road. If you remember the story, uh, there is a nemesis in this whole story by the name of Haman. And Haman essentially is trying to destroy the Jews, destroy, get rid of them. He's got a personal vendetta trying to take care of them. And little known fact, Esther is actually a Jew. Whoop, surprising. That's a nice little caveat to the story. So in this whole process, while he's trying to eliminate them, Esther and her uncle Mordecai, who also was a de facto father for her, uh, kind of work out Mordecai saying, look, I need you to speak to the king. Here's a problem. You go to talk to a king without being invited, doesn't matter who you are, okay, he can take you out. Queen or no queen. So this is, a, this is something where she has to find it within herself and she has to have some kind of extra sense of bravery uh, to uh, accomplish something that's bigger than who she is. And, and this is where we get that phrase, uh, everyone said, for such a time as this. This is where the phrase comes from. Mordecai saying, you're in this place for such a time as this. 
So ultimately, we find that Esther gathers up the courage. She speaks to the king, tells him, hey, look, this bad guy Haman here is trying to destroy my people, trying to destroy my family, and ultimately comes out on top. Esther 3, 4 says, the queen answered, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request, for we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. She was very bold, confident, standing up not only for her family, but for her people. And God put her in a position to be able to help his people, just like mothers are in a position to be able to help their children. So this morning, the carnations help remind us that God put mothers in a position to help their children. The next flower is a kind of unique flower, pretty cool, I think, for what it, uh, what it stands for. And this is the, uh, don't look at that tag, gladiolas. Anyone know this? Anyone is like a favorite flower of anyone? It's kind of a sweet looking uh, little flower. So the gladiolas, they represent uh, strength and moral integrity. Uh, their name comes from a Latin called gladius, which means sword. And if you kind of look at it, it's got a little sword, the, the leaves and, and the way the flower finishes out kind of has a, a sword feeling to it. Uh, if you give someone a bouquet of uh, gladiolas, you're telling them that they have pierced your heart. Yeah, that's sick. Okay, so gladiolas <laughs> have a very, uh, very strong uh, meaning with strength and moral integrity, and I think of it like an actual sword. Use a sword, what, to protect? And when we think about moms, has anyone ever seen uh, a mama bear? I'm not talking about in the wild. I'm talking about someone messes with your baby. Mama bear comes out, right? Yeah, so we, uh, we all know what's going on with mother. Mothers can be a bit protective of their children. I don't know if you know this or not. Uh, so when I'm looking through the scriptures, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm flipping the script a little bit on this one, and I'm looking at Ruth and Naomi, and looking at their, the relationship that they had. Now, Naomi was Ruth's mother-in-law, uh, so this is a great uh, example of uh, establishing a good relationship with your mother-in-law. Naomi uh, not only lost her husband, but also her two sons had passed away. And Naomi essentially said, look, uh, it, she just threw herself into grief pretty much, told her daughters-in-law, go, go back to your homelands, don't bother with me, I'm done. She, she went so far, so deep into despair that she uh, even changed her name to Mara, which means bitter tears. I mean, how bad is life when you go down that road? But the unique thing is Ruth decided not to listen to her. And Ruth refuses and actually recommits herself to Naomi. And she says, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing, this, a lot of times this uh, statement, uh, the scriptures are used in weddings. So Ruth said in, uh, in chat, verse 16 and 17, she said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. And here's the, this big phrase, for where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything, put de but death parts me from you. So Ruth, she's all in. She sees her mother-in-law, sees the despair, and uh, something about Ruth felt like she felt compelled to stay with Naomi, not just Naomi, but Naomi's God, the God of the Israelites, the God that we serve today. She commits to not only staying with Naomi, to protecting her, to taking care of her, and to shielding her from this harsh reality, because Naomi, she was without husband, she's without family, she had nothing, Ruth kind of jumped in on that. So Ruth, ultimately, throughout the story, you follow Ruth, she brings home food, she eventually marries Boaz, she takes care of her mother-in-law in a way that only a woman can. So this morning, when we look at the gladiolas, we are reminded of a woman's strength and her fierce desire to protect the people that she loves. That's the uh, gladiolus, which is probably the hardest one uh, for me to say. Next in our beautiful bouquet of flowers comes the hydrangea, which is a neat-looking uh, little flower arrangement. It's kind of like a ball of, uh, of flowers. Uh, the word uh, hydrangea in Greek comes from hydro and angro, which uh, hydro means... Ah, 
Good, very good. That's, I like that. Some of you confidently said water, and some of you waited for the person next to you to say the answer before you said it. It came in like four different phases here. Water, what? Yeah, yeah, I knew that. Angos means jar or vessel. And if you kind of look at this flower, it kind of looks like a jar of, uh, of water. Even the color kind of got that. So in uh, translating it, it means water barrel, water barrel. So I look through the Bible, and I'm thinking, all right, let's, water's a pretty significant thing. And there are a few uh, women in the Bible where water played a role. But then I started to think about the Samaritan woman at the well, that Jesus met at the well. Now, this one, I have to be honest, I really got invested in this story in exploring not only um, the, the woman at the well, but the symbolism. There is so much symbolism in this story, uh, even just as simple as the location. Like, Jesus was not supposed to be in that city. He was not supposed to be anywhere near Samaria, Samaritans, because they just, Jews and, the, and Samaritans didn't interact. It just wasn't supposed to be. On top of that, uh, men weren't supposed to speak to women at that time. <laughs> like in a public setting, you didn't sit down and talk to women. Women were seen, not heard, essentially, uh, in those times. So he's breaking all kinds of social norms to reach not only this woman, but we'll see eventually reach her, the whole city because Jesus is that kind of guy. <laughs> he didn't come to follow along with the religious and the, and the social norms, but he wanted to break them out. So in John chapter 4, we see this woman midday is going, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. <laughs> and throughout the time, they, in, they start to interact, and she's shocked that he's talking to her. Uh, he's telling her about living water. Not just water from the well, but actual living water. And through the conversation, she recognizes him as God's son. There's like this revelation as he's telling her about her. Like he knows every detail of her life, and he's sharing that with her. And she's kind of like, okay, this is no ordinary guy. Eventually, she recalls some of the teachings that she has heard, recognizes him as the son of God, and then leaves, goes running off to tell everyone about this man, Jesus, the Son of God, here in our town, in our city. And because of the power of this story, she herself became a bearer of living water. She became an evangelist, the loud evangelist, because she told everybody. She led the whole town back to Jesus. Later on in chapter 4, we say, so the woman left her water jar, went away into the town. Imagine the excitement. She's just going, this guy, she said, come see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. She is, I just see her just running through. You got to come see this guy. You got to come see him. You got to come see him. And people are starting to come out and they're starting to gather around this man, Jesus. And we find later in the chapter that many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. She said, he told me all that I ever did. Mothers teach their children. Mothers have a beautiful opportunity that begins at the home. So the hydrangea reminds us of the importance of sharing and teaching the faith, just like the woman at the well shared the faith that she had in Jesus. So the hydrangea. So the next flower we're going to talk about is a cool flower. They're all cool, I guess, in their own right. What's this? Sunflower. Good. Give yourself a pat on the back. This is the sunflower. The sunflower is a really unique flower. I mean, it's, it's got a lot going for it. Aside from the fact, I like them best when they're dead because I like to have their seeds uh, during the softball games. So I know that came out really harsh, but uh, it's okay. It's, uh, this one's fake. It didn't hurt its feelings. So sunflower uh, has a really unique attribute in that during the night or during the day, the sunflower will follow the sun. It will literally, as the sun goes over, the sunflower will turn and face the sun. So it will start the morning facing east because the sun rises in the East, good, okay. And then at the end of the night, it'll be facing west because the sun sets in the... Very good, okay. And then during the night, we have a problem. It's facing west. What does it need to do during the night? It needs to turn back towards the 
east, okay? And every sunflower has this activity going through. If you just Google time-lapse sunflower, it's kind of neat, it's really bizarre to watch this flower kind of go through. Now these, the only flowers that do that, it's not the mature flowers that do it, it's the ones that are growing. The ones that are growing, the ones that need the most sun. What ends up happening later on is once it matures, it stops, it faces a certain direction to kind of attract the bees. There's a whole science, you know, that kind of stuff. So sunflowers make me think, uh, sunflowers are following the sun. So I'm thinking, all right, who is chasing after the sun? Get it, sun, S-U-N, sun, S-O-N. It's kind of a play on words. Yeah, it, you'll get it. So who is following the sun? And I think of Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany is uh, criticized, actually, for her following of the sun. And we look in Mark 14, uh, said, while she was at Bethany in the house of Simon, the leper, as he was reclining at a table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head, There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Mary of Bethany uh, was, she's known for just kind of giving up, like everything that's going on around her. She ignores what's going on and she focuses on Jesus. That's kind of like what her reputation is. She is focused on the sun. So just as sunflowers follow the sun, Mary followed the sun. Wordplay, all right? So mothers, I believe, are called to teach children to follow the sun, to follow Jesus Christ so that their children may also follow the sun. The next flower we have is the peonies. Another big old bulky, lots of petals. Uh, peonies are actually they're really cool flowers. They're neat kind of bushes. They all kind of gather together. You get a big, uh, big bush of peonies. But one of the unique things about peonies is sometimes they get so much going on, so much weight going on in their petals that they start to, to bend a little bit. And they will, even in their bending, they, they bend but don't break. There's a mom right there, right? They bend but don't break. They still flower. They still produce these beautiful petals, but they're willing to bend without breaking. And when we look in the Bible, there's a lot, there's a whole lot going on of men in the Bible who are leading people, leading the Israelites, leading the Jews, leading people to Christ. What we miss a lot of times is behind these men stand women. And there's that statement, behind every great man is a woman. Uh, Hubert Humphrey is quoted, he said, behind every successful man is a proud wife and a surprised mother-in-law. <laughs> so I'm looking through the Bible, I'm like, man, there's so many examples. Like, what, what did Noah's wife think when Noah came back and said, hey, babe, uh, I have to build a boat? She's like, great, I love boating. <laughs> yeah, and we got to bring some animals with us. Okay, great. I love my dogs. Yeah, only two of them. (laughs) And the boat's got to be like the size of many football fields, and we're going to bring all the creatures, and the whole world's going to be underwater. Huh, what? (laughs) I can imagine that conversation was not an easy one for her to take, but she, she went through the process. Everything Noah was going through, she was going through as well. Then I think of Moses and Moses' wife. Moses comes back and says, uh, hey, babe, I talked to a bush today. <laughs> oh, really? Did you bring water with you like I told you to? Well, yeah, but it wasn't any regular bush. It was on fire. Sure it was, honey. Go sit down. And he says, God wants me to free the people. I'm going to lead them out of Egypt. That's a flexible woman to be able to roll with that. 
And she's with him. And she says, listen, we're going to come to water, and we're going to walk across on dry land. Like, how bizarre is that? And she's walking this, this path with him. These wives are walking with, with these men. I think of Sarah and Abram. Abram comes back and says, hey, I've been talking to God, and we're going to move. Uh, where are we going? I don't know yet, but we'll figure it out when we get there. <laughs> Sounds like every man on a trip. Uh, but she was with him. She supported him through that process, and, and he put her through some bizarre stuff, and she stuck with him through that. Eventually, they have a son who's going to be the beginning of generations and generations of people, and I see Abraham going, hey, babe, uh, listen, I'm going to take, uh, take our son up to the mountain for a sacrifice, and I'm going to sacrifice him. Uh, what was that? <laughs> Women, mothers, are very flexible. Uh, children, the last I checked don't come with instruction books. Mothers bend, don't break. They go with the flow and yet remain beautiful throughout the whole process. The next flower is a flower iris, and I could probably do a whole series just on this flower and the symbolism of it. If you look, the the flower has kind of three prominent uh, petals throughout it. Some uh, take that to represent the Trinity, and they'll go down that road, and there's a number of different ways. The iris, um, it was a symbol that Joan of Arc used uh, when she was on uh, her crusades and, and uh, her, her battles. But the iris uh, stands for faith, valor, and wisdom. Faith, valor, and wisdom. And it, it brought to mind a couple stories of a couple women in the Bible. And uh, the first one is a very popular uh, message to preach on Mother's Day, and that's about Hannah. Remember Hannah? Hannah was the mother of Samuel, one of my favorite uh, guys in the Bible. No reason. Uh, Samuel was, a, was prayed for and prayed for for many, many years. Hannah uh, would go to the temple, and she'd be praying so hard and so earnestly for God to give her a son that it literally, the priest thought she was drunk. In 1 Samuel 1, we see that she was deeply distressed, and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. Hannah answered, No, my lord. I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. And eventually she has this beautiful baby boy, names him Samuel, one of the greatest names in the Bible. And uh, I can't help but think that it, through that process, that her desire for a child was bigger than just a mother's desire to have a son. Because if she, her desire was just to have a son and commit him over to the Lord, if you, a few years later when he's weaned, so that could be anywhere between the ages of four and six, she literally brings him to the temple to stay, and she leaves him there. What mother wants a child to give away? Every mother wants to hoard their children. I'm afraid my boys will live in my house forever. Every mother wants to hang on to their children. I think Hannah had something a little bit extra in her. She not only wanted a child, but she wanted someone else that she could raise up to chase after God. I really truly believe she felt that way. So she's praying earnestly to have the child, and then can you imagine, so she, she has Sam, do you think she stopped praying for him? I don't think anyone's prayed more for their child than Hannah has prayed for Samuel. And Samuel went on to do some incredible things, and God used Samuel in some very unique ways with some great leaders in the Bible. He had influence over them. And Hannah, I believe, is the epitome of faith and wisdom and, of course, prayer for her child. The other example, I want to, when I think of the iris, the other one that jumps into me is uh, actually uh, we had a Sunday school lesson last week in group about the, the only female uh, judge, and that's Deborah. 
And the story of Deborah is, is pretty cool. So we had like girl power last week in Sunday school. Uh, the story of Deborah is really unique. She was uh, the, the female judge. She ruled for 40 years, which is right up there with everyone else and, and uh, a whole generation following after God under her leadership, so to speak. Uh, they, the story of judges is very cyclical. You read through the chapters said they followed after God and they were doing good. And then they fall after and then the Canaanites or someone came and took them, took them over. And then they cried out to God and he relieved them. And over and over, it's this big sick cycle. In this case, they're under the oppression of the Canaanites. Canaanites have this huge, massive army, like chariots. Like the, the, the picture they paint is this, this army that is un, undefeatable, that is uh, unable to be beaten with their people. And so Deborah and Barak, who's also helping out in leadership, they, uh, God gives Deborah words, says, look, we're going to go ahead. I hear the cries of my people. Let's go. Let's take care of this. She tells Barak. Barak says, look, I'm not going down there to do that, not unless you come with me. So Deborah says, all right, I'll go, but you're not going to get any real credit for this. God's going to hand, uh, hand him over. Sisera, who's the, uh, the, the lead bad guy in the story, I'm going to hand Sisera over to someone else. In Judges 4 and 9, she says, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road in which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. So they get into this battle. They fight. The whole army is defeated except for the, uh, the leader, Sisera. Sisera runs off, finds a tent of a family, uh, a husband and wife that he's familiar with, gets in the tent. Uh, the wife's name happens to be J.L. J., uh, sits down. J.L. gives him a nice glass of milk, says, hey, just relax, lay down here, lays down. And then J.L. drives a tent spike through his head. And she defeats Sisera all by herself. God handed Sisera over into that. Girl power, right? Guys, look where the tent spikes are before you lay down. <laughs> so Deborah is the only female judge. Judges 5, 7 says, The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. I, Deborah, arose as mother in Israel. Deborah, a mother of Israel, strong, courageous, hearing God, a picture of valor, valor in the face of adversity. And like Hannah and Deborah's example, we look at the iris as mothers who stand as representations of faith, wisdom, and valor in their families. The heather, two more flowers. The heather flower, not as uh, distinctive with its petals, the heather flower, uh, its scientific name is called Coluna vulgaris, which means to clean or to brush. And actually, the twigs of this heather plant are often used to make uh, brooms or baskets, uh, ropes, uh, bedding, uh, thatch roofs. It's, it's really, a, there's a lot of commonality, a lot of common things that it is used for. And we think of commonality, we think, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times you hear the phrase, I'm just a stay-at-home mom just. And we hear that as a common thing. We don't see that. But the Heather reminds me of uh, another quote-unquote person in the Bible who did uh, common things, and that's Martha. Martha of Bethany, Mary of Bethany's sister. Martha had this incredible uh, work ethic and this servanthood that uh, was recognized a number of different times in the scriptures. But in Luke chapter 10 says, as they went on the way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. And the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And then later on in John, we see Martha serving again. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Martha had incredible faith in Jesus, not to, not to uh, discredit her at all. If you remember the story of Lazarus, Lazarus uh, passed away. Jesus took three days to get there uh, in that process. Martha confronts Jesus. She sees Jesus coming. She runs out to meet him. And John chapter 11 says, When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went, met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She knows. She knows the healing power of Jesus. But even now, she says, Look, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. She said, I, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. 
And Jesus said, no, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Martha said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. I truly believe that one of Martha's gifts was doing the common work, the cooking, the cleaning, the, the house prep. Uh, one of the same, having kids is uh, like continually cleaning, having to clean up after a party that you weren't invited to. <laughs> Phyllis Diller says, cleaning your house while your kids are still growing is like shoveling the walk before it stops snowing. And many moms can relate to that. Mothers do a lot of uh, what we call common work. It's never ending. Uh, with children, cleaning is uh, sometimes like trying to staple jelly to a wall. It just doesn't work. Uh, it's a part of life, but it's a beautiful part of life. So when we look at the heather plant, I think of Martha, and I think that there is an uncommon beauty in a mother who does the common work. Our last flower is a pretty unique flower, the anthurium, anthurium, which is, a, it's a bizarre looking flower. It's kind of got like a waxy uh, look to, to the almost leaf looking uh, petal. In actuality, they say the flowers are, are coming out of this little stem here. Uh, if you look, what kind of shape does it have? A heart. Good. Science. All right. So they open up. These things have a heart-shaped flower. The anthurium kind of has the uh, inclination of hospitality. This is the, the meaning of hospitality. Uh, in Acts chapter 14, we catch up with Paul and Silas. And Paul and Silas are visiting the city of Philippi. And when the Sabbath rolls around, Paul and Silas are looking for a place to worship. But in Philippi, there is no synagogue. Because back in those days, you had to have at least 10 men, 10 heads of household, to build a synagogue. So there weren't even 10 uh, Jewish men in the city to be able to build a synagogue. When they went looking to worship, what they found was a, in a field or over uh, by a river, they found a group of women praying. And uh, they joined them there. One of my uh, really unique experiences I got to have uh, is a few years ago, I was able to go to Israel. And we w were able to go to the, the Wailing Wall, the wall of the temple, if, you, if anyone can kind of picture that uh, scenario. Now, at that Wailing Wall, you kind of separate. There's a men's side and there's a women's side. Uh, that's just uh, how culture dic dictates it. But then we got to go uh, on a path that kind of followed the edge of the wall, kind of followed a path, and we're going underneath all these structures, uh, kind of going underground, walking a path that Jesus very well would have taken. And while we're in that path, we came upon a group of Jewish women that were praying. But they weren't just praying. I mean, they were passionately praying and crying out to God. And it just moved me so much. It was one of the most significant. It just stuck in my heart that these women had so much passion for God, and they're crying out to him. A little bit disheartening because they, as, as much as they're praying out to him, crying out to God, they, they're still missing Jesus, and that kind of hurt. But their passion is what really stuck out to me. And they were just unashamedly crying out to God. And I can imagine when we get, when Paul and Silas get to this situation, they see all these women out in the field, this is what they're seeing, this passion, this, this crying out to God, these, these people who are wanting to worship and serve God regardless if there's a building or a place for it. And I think there's some significance to uh, them get gathering in the open field so that other followers of God, other followers of Christ. So Paul and Silas get there, they see this group, and they start to share uh, the story of Jesus. It says, On the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside where we were supposed there was a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of uh, Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. She was saying, Look, come, come to my house. I want to hear more about this. She had the spirit of hospitality. She's like, Come. Basically, she used her salvation as a, as a ploy to try to draw them in. She's basically saying, Look, if you think I'm saved, then you have to come at my, hang out at my house. If you think, if this thing's real, come with me. And it says, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. She wants to be a blessing to them. She wants to encourage them. She wants to hear more from them. She wants her friends and her family to get opportunities to hear the good news. She was extending hospitality, and she was very persistent 
about it. Now, very soon after this incident, Paul and Silas get thrown into jail. Uh, but as soon as they were released, we find they go directly to Lydia's house. And Acts 16, 40 says they went out of prison, visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. So like the Anthurium, uh, the representation of hospitality, I think of Lydia, I think of mothers in general represent a special level of hospitality. Mom, women are very, very special in the kingdom of God and play a huge role in sharing Christ with not only their families, but their friends. Women uh, build relationships in a very special way, and I think that's intentional, uh, that God uses that to be able to grow his kingdom, to be able to spread his word. Uh, when I think of flowers, there's a lot of flowers we could go into. I mean, we, we didn't even touch on the roses or orchids or sandstone, daisies. There's, there's so many different flowers, so many different women in the Bible that we could go down and explore. But this morning, this is our bouquet. This is what we share. This is what's going on for us. Mother's Day, we have the carnation that remind us that mothers are always in a position to help their children. We have the gladiolas that remind us of a woman's strength. The hydrangeas remind us of a woman's important job to teach the faith. The sunflowers remind us to follow the sun. The peonies remind us that mothers can go with the flow and yet remain beautiful. The iris mothers stand as a representation of faith wisdom and valor like the heather there is uncommon beauty in a mother who does the common work and the anthurium reminds us that mothers represent a special level of hospitality and i thank you so much uh, for for those who have taken on the task of being a mother whether it's uh, your own child whether it's an adopted child whether it's a, a community that you've adopted it is a special thing that god has empowered you for and i pray that you're seeking God, as you uh, do this, uh, this service that he has given to you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for uh, the women in our lives who are chasing after you, God, and the people that are following them as they follow you. What a beautiful, beautiful thing you've given to us, these moms. <laughs> I thank you for the mothers in my life, for the mothers uh, represented in this church, for the women in general, God, who are chasing after you. Is your great, holy, precious name we pray. Amen. God bless. Mothers, have a great dinner. I'm sure you got something planned for.